Welcome back to the program after the break. Now, Alan, I was asking the question, why uh, they pick up this, the weakest person and uh, uh, put him at the helm of affairs of an organization such as United Nations? Each as in the round, we can say there are two ways to run the world. There is either jungle law or there is international law. Now, looking at the world today, I think uh, if somebody came from another world and viewed the place, he'd assume that jungle law was uh, prevailing. It goes back to this, really the problem of the veto power. The five nations with the veto, they're not interested in anything but their own definition of their own self-interest. And the last thing they want is a straightforward, incorruptible, fearless Secretary General who will say, look, this is what our charter requires us to do. Let's do it. They only want people they can manipulate by one means or another. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. It's not a mystery. Mm -hmm. Now, here again, I mean, sometimes when we say we are fascinated to learn that, uh, you know, uh, the first major, first serious international conference was uh, hosted by Iran in 1943. And there, the power, powerful leaders, they decided, okay, on the proposal of Tehran, we will be setting up a United Nations. So this again, in a way, the first session in, 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 uh, of, of the time when the United Nations wasn't even formed. So it was the initiative of, uh, of Iran. So Iran is uh, the victim of United Nations. Uh, half a dozen resolutions, they've been passed against Iran and they, they cannot be justified. So why Iran as, as uh, at on, the, on the receiving ends all the time? Well, so we, we, have, we, we have a caller on the line before we take okay. that answer. Yeah, please, Salaam Alaikum. Hello, Assalamu Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum as -salam. Brother, your name, please? It's Mahmoud. Brother Mahmoud, welcome to the program. Yes, what would you like to say? I would like to say that in 2008, when we had the credit crunch, it has actually been mentioned in the Bible and also in the Torah and also in the Holy Quran that we'll have seven years of tribulation or seven years of drought. And I think in Judaism also they have a seven year tetrad cycle. Now, we are in that tetrad cycle or in the seven years of drought, or is it called the seven years tribulation? And then we have the rapture. Huh? And the economy has actually been closed down through myself, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, or Elohim. It's one entity, so that humankind can come back to the basics mm -hmm. and start looking after each other in a brotherly way. Mm -hmm. The UN is a defunct sort of institution. It doesn't look after anyone apart from the five major people who actually have voting rights there. Thank you very much, Brother Mahmoud. We got your point. Yeah, would you like to... I mean, I think you comment on, on, on his point first, then we will take the answer later. Yeah, but it isn't just the UN. All our governments are really in the same thing. As I've said before on your program, our leaders, be they in the UN or our government, they don't really care about the ordinary citizens. Nothing is going to change won't make any reference to Allah or, or, or Bible or anything else. Nothing is going to change until enough citizens of enough nations become engaged in the political process, Ijaz. Mm -hmm. And if necessary, take to the streets in great numbers peacefully and say to their governments, we are not putting up with this. If we remain apathetic, as we basically are, it's a free ride for the system to do what it wants. So that proves our point then. This is the time to pack it up and uh, introduce a more representative and without any veto power, as we said at the start of the program, a proper and truly representative body of 207 countries having equal rights at the General Assembly. But at the it just, if you didn't have the United Nations, you'd have to invent it. Yeah. I mean, you know, we do need an international body. As I said, only two ways to run the world, jungle law, or international law, which includes requiring all member states to live by decent, civilized norms of behavior respecting human rights. Um, so you have to have an institution. It's how you make that institution work. Uh, getting you rid of the veto is the key thing. Yeah, we have another caller. Assalamu alaikum, brother. Your name, please? 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's Mahmoud again. I think I got cut off. Just got one more point to add that a universal credit has been actually put into Great Britain by myself through my local MP, and it's supposed to be rolled out worldwide. The British government has only put it there for the British citizens at the moment, but it's actually a mega, mega plan by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have put it through Britain, and then we have to replicate it throughout the world so that every human being on earth gets the benefit, the housing benefit, automatically on a mobile phone, like the Mopesa system that's in case, so that you can get your money anywhere, even in the middle of a desert, where there might not even be a cash point. Thank you, thank you, brother. Thank you, thanks for your point. Yeah. You have your uh, reflection I, on that? Well, I, <coughs> excuse me. I'm not understanding, <coughs> because so many people don't have money to start off with. I mean, if you look at India, you have a population of about 1.4 billion, 1.234 billion. You have 100 million who are wealthy, getting more and more wealthy. You have 800 million who are poor and getting poorer. So how does uh, Mahmoud's uh, system work? I don't understand it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the problem with India is that uh, India is uh, aspiring uh, unreasonably to get into the, 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 the permanent seat at the UN uh, <coughs> Security <coughs> Council as the sixth member of the, of the veto power. And I would not be surprised that that happens uh, in next year or so. But then what about Japan and Germany? They would be uh, also in the queue. They're bigger economies, more responsible nations th than India. No aggression has been uh, reported from them after the, after the Second World War, neither from Japan nor from, from Germany, both defeated powers. And India uh, has uh, persecuted uh, uh, her, her own uh, uh, you know, citizens in almost two dozen states. And how can we justify that? But it is not only that. Indian President, uh, Prime Minister Modi, is sucking up to Israel. And he's going yeah. to be going to Israel quite soon. So I reckon he'll be counting on a lot of American is stroke Israel support mm -hmm. to get India into the uh, Security Council. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think we have to watch out for that. What was the UN role in the eight-year Iran-Iraq war of 1980s? Oh, I tell you another true story. We had uh, Paris Dicoyard de that. Mm? Paris Dicoyard. Uh, this is a, a true story. Halfway through that war, I had an occasion to go to the Foreign Office and meet the top Middle East uh, man there, uh, Stephen Edgerton, who went on to become ambassador to Saudi Arabia and Italy and then died. And I said to him, Stephen, we're four years into the eight year war, why is this war being allowed to continue? And he said, Alan, with you, all your experience, are you so naive? He said, look, all the time they're fighting, we're earning good money from selling them weapons. When they've had enough, we'll earn good money from developing their countries. Hmm. Now, maybe he was exaggerating to make a point, but he actually said it. There's not too much interest in stopping wars. Who are the biggest arms manufacturers and sellers? the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So there is so much hypocrisy. Now before the program we were discussing the budget. Yeah. Seven billion dollars the United Nations gets every year to, I mean the budget for the current year was seven, it just, just a little more than seven billion dollars. And uh, this is not a big money for such a huge organization. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, you can't even fund comfortably uh, the WHO, the, the, the food organization, the, the UNICEF, UNESCO, yeah. and, and uh, about 100 peacekeeping missions on, on the planet, maybe smaller and, and bigger. So $7 billion is just a very small amount. I, d I didn't know it was... I, are you sure it's only yes. $7 billion? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, the Gulf states could provide that without sneezing, couldn't they? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's a relatively small sum. No, there, there's no great interest amongst the major powers in wanting the UN to work as it should. M more often than not, it's a talking shop, is it not? Or, or before we write a requiem on United Nations and pack it up, maybe we can uh, hand over to Saudi Arabia, and they pay $70 billion, and they say, all right, United Nations is my domain, so I'm Khadimani Haramani Sharif, and now this is my third empire, I can run that. So what about that? <laughs> no, you, you, you have to have a world body. As I said before, if the UN didn't exist, you'd have to invent it. Mm -hmm. It's how you make it work. Mm -hmm. 
you had take a look at the Charter, what's in the Charter, peace and security and human rights and nations behaving in a civilized way, and you have to be prepared to sanction them and, and take measures to enforce things. Sometimes the UN tries to enforce, more often than not, it doesn't. Look at, look at Israel. How many vetoes have we had? I mean, Israel has you know, been brought up before the Security Council, I don't know, 34, 40 times, and each time the, the uh, Americans veto it. I think the instrument of veto, perhaps that was invented for Israel. <laughs> well, as we've already said and touched upon, I think Part one of any reform is removal of the veto power. And you have to have decisions made by a certain majority within the whole UN, be it two thirds, be it even as high as 80%. But the trouble is, we have so many corrupt governments all over the world. Yeah, well, 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 we can welcome his call here, yeah, please. We have Mahmoud again online because he's taking interest in that. So next time um, we would invite him in one of our programs. Yeah, please, uh, Brother Mahmoud. Yeah, you actually mentioned about Saudi Arabia with all the funding that is got from the oil revenues. What do they do? They just plunder it on gambling and on Monaco and on women and you name whatever. They've got double standards, these Saudis. The princes actually drink alcohol in their own country. I've seen them with my own two eyes about 25 years ago. They are a bunch of hypocrites. Mm -hmm. We can't have them as a world leader, can we? Look at them bombing Yemen, fellow Muslims, bombing people in Syria, bombing people every damn place on earth. Their own Muslim brothers they bombing away and they call themselves carers of the Haramain. My foot. Thank you. Thank you, brother. Thanks. Thanks again. So, Brother Mahmood is taking a lot of interest in our, in our program here. So that's something, the topic is very close to that. You have uh, a take on that? Yeah, I do. I mean, when you look at what Saudi Arabia is doing now, I mean, I think Saudi Arabia is in a sense speeding up its own downfall. Mm -hmm. I, the poverty to which Yemen was poor, but now, I mean, what is happening is terrifying. But what it, the destruction and the killing that's happening in Syria, Iraq, and other countries in Africa. I mean, for God's sake, th this is what the UN should be addressing. Mm -hmm. I tell you, there's one man who maybe could have made it work. Rude though Mahmoud is about the Saudis, and I am essentially as rude today. The Saudi I most admired was King Faisal. Mm -hmm. He was capable of banging heads together mm -hmm. and making people behave sensibly. Mm -hmm. It needs, the world needs a few more leaders like him. But because he was actually so good, look what happened to him. So we need to craft a genuine new world order where we don't have a United Nations. I mean, you just look at that. Organization of Islamic countries, 58 bunch of uh, useless Muslim states not doing anything. Uh, they are defunct. Uh, Non-aligned movement, again, third world countries, 120 members of that, is, is dead. Arab League, Gulf Cooperation Council, only look after, looking after their interests. And if United Nations is also following the same, I mean, same fate, then obviously we are in search of an international organization. But Ijaz, let me show you what a starry-eyed idealist I probably am. We aren't going to change the UN politics unless we can agree on what I've described to you before as one common humanity. The first thing that any overseeing world body ought to have is an agreement and a commitment to ensuring that every man, woman and child on earth had the most basic, most basic human rights like adequate food, mm -hmm. water, mm -hmm. health care, education, a job, uh, and there were one or two others. Until we can get our collective minds around the need for that one common humanity approach, I don't see any hope of changing the world. Now again, coming to the funding, uh, the UN Secretary General a couple of weeks ago, he openly admitted that he has failed to fund the Syrian refugees. And then he said that United Nations failed in Iraq and in Afghanistan addressing the refugee problem. The UN uh, has got a very big organ that's looking after the, 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 the humanitarian issues and another one, the refugees issues. 
So Syria is, 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 is a very big test for the United Nations. Uh, Germany is another very big test for the United Nations, Palestine. So these three issues, I think uh, this could be the last chance for the United Nations if the United Nations plays some role towards uh, bringing about a truly representative and durable peace plan for these three regions, then we can say living another 10 years or so. Otherwise, I don't find any, any, any future for the United Nations. In no, they, w without basic reform, including the, the veto uh, being removed, I don't see any hope. And the latest news that I've got is that the people seeking to take a lead on Syria now are actually Angela Merkel, the German, yes. uh, with a little bit of assistance from David Cameron. Mm -hmm. And what they are proposing is that they do a deal with Russia to have Putin's influence to require Assad to stand aside. Now, mm -hmm. I think I said to you two programs ago, what makes me so depressed is that Syria could have been stopped uh, from having its catastrophe within weeks of it starting if Obama had had a private conversation with Putin yeah. and said to him, what's your price for requiring Assad to go to create the space for new elections? Mm -hmm. I am absolutely certain Putin at that stage would have named a price which was acceptable. But that question is still valid. No, it is. It is. Well, I think that's what Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. uh, with some assistance from David Cameron, are in the process of, of putting to Putin right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, she, she discussed so many points yesterday at the U7 summit, and uh, this was one of them, giving uh, Russia some space to, to, to play its role. Yeah. So th th that's going to be a very thing. And anyway, uh, we discussed this issue uh, within these 35, 40 minutes we had today. Uh, it's a big question, uh, and the answer is also very big. It's more than one answer to this question. And uh, as uh, Alan Hart, he, he, uh, he underscored that until and unless the veto power is withdrawn, the United Nations will continue to be a football, sometimes kicked by the uh, United States, sometimes by Russia, sometimes by China, with the, using the veto power. With that, we end our program. And uh, thank you very much for being with us. And we are thankful to Brother Mahmoud, who, uh, who called three times and passed his uh, erudite knowledge about the, the, the issue today. And with that, we, thanks, uh, we, we thank uh, Alan Hart also for being uh, with us again today. And see you next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.